Hello and welcome to Cracking the Cryptic. Um, now, for some time, I think we've neglected um, what's in the title of the blog, uh, the, the title of our series, Cryptic Crosswords. Um, we originally, I think, started with a plan to do mostly cryptics and, and a few Sudoku hints. Um, and kind of the viewing of the videos has suggested to us that Sudoku is more popular. Now, if you're a cryptic crossword fan and you want to do something about that, then view more videos and uh, leave us some comments because that's the only way we can really judge how the, uh, the videos are going down. But I did want to um, add my congratulations to some Simon's already put out there to Lucy Evans, who um, became a published crossword setter for the Daily Telegraph in a, in a top British broadsheet um, as a teenager. And I mean, that's something that neither, neither Simon or I have ever achieved in our longer lives. And uh, sincere congratulations to Lucy. We were very surprised, I think, that she uh, posted a comment to the effect that, that we've helped inspire her very fast journey into the into the ranks of setting crosswords and um, touched if that's the case um, and thought we'd give we've we've always focused on solving crosswords thought I'd give a little um, few ideas on setting crosswords on writing clues because. That is a great art in my view, and I think Lucy came up with some great clues in her first puzzle. Um, and here I'm looking at one of the recent emails from the Times. If you join up with, a, with their crossword club, they'll send out uh, weekly emails if you want, um, giving you some puzzles to have a look at, talking about mind sports and the crossword editor's pick of the week's crossword clues. So this is from a few weeks ago, as you can see, they were early November. Um, and the crossword editor, Richard Rogan, selected five clues from the week's puzzles that he thought were amongst the best. And I'm just going to look at why he thought they were amongst the best, and I certainly agree. And what's good about the clues, and the, this effectively provides, therefore, a, a guide as to how to write clues and give solvers what they want. Now, what they want, in my opinion, is a good aha moment, a real click where they get the clue, they hadn't seen it at first, and they now understand it, and, and yet they can see how they were misled, and they get the whole picture. So that's the good thing. Um, and... There are different ways of writing good crossword clues. And in fact, solvers want variety through the puzzle. So if you're solving 30 clues in a puzzle, you don't want the same kind of click each time. You want, slight, you want to be led down slightly different paths. So looking at these one by one, um, this first one, Luther's prose adapted for stuffy artisans, 12 letters. Now that's quite long. Um, these, I think, were from the quick crosswords this week. So. They're not going to be that hard in a way to see how the clue works. And adapted is a quite likely anagram indicator. And therefore, Luther's prose was it, with its 12 letters um, provides the likely fodder for the anagram. But then we want stuffy artisans to be the definition. And we have to work out what that means. Obviously, the clue already has a nice surface. It reads as though it's something to do with kind of Martin Luther's um, writings about the church and people, you know, maybe reactionary people not liking it. That's a very clever um, surface that the clue has. But the stuffy is the interesting word here, I think, when you're looking for the definition. It's artisans, so that's workmen who do stuffing. And apart from taxidermists, I think the only one one can think of is people who stuff furniture. So the answer here is um, an anagram of Luther's prose, and it turns out to be upholsterers. Um, I can't write that, that's embarrassing. There we go. Um, which is a nice anagram of Luther's prose. You can see how the artisans are stuffy because they do stuffing. And all in all, you know, very neatly phrased, just six words, really short clue to a long, long answer. 
that's how to use an, the, an anagram. In fact, if you're a compiler looking at that, although long words often do give you scope to come up with good anagrams because there's a lot of letters to play with, those aren't that promising as letters. There's no I's and A's, no N's. And yet, that's a really, nice, a really neat clue. So we'll move on to the next one. Some fear bankruptcy coming up for Scottish Bank. And I think why this is picked, why I really like it, is because the answer is nothing to do with what you think you're reading about. Some fear bankruptcy coming up for Scottish Bank is a sentence you might easily have read as a headline, um, say, during the financial crisis or even currently. You know, it could be RBS or, or Bank of Scotland and bankruptcy is looming. Beautifully phrased clue. It could easily mean that. And yet, the clue is not about finance at all. The answer is nothing to do with that. <clears throat> some, you know, if, you, if you're familiar with crosswords, we, we've given this tip before, some is a very clear indicator of a hidden clue in, in many ways. And coming up suggests that this was a down clue and you need to turn the answer around to send it upwards. So a part of fear bankruptcy, four letters, reversed will give you a Scottish bank. But this bank isn't the Royal Bank of Scotland. It's Bray, a bank beside a river, a hillside kind of thing. Um, Bonnie Bray's you may be familiar with. If you don't know any uh, Scottish dialect words, you might not know that. But beautifully phrased clue. I mean, so neatly done that that's, that meaning of bank is entirely not the meaning of bank you were thinking of. And this is a great idea for a compiler to use a homophone, a word that has two completely different meanings um, is always, and to make sure that the surface meaning, what the clue seems to mean, uses the other meaning of the clue. Uh, the other meaning of the word is a great tip because that gives you the nice click when you get the answer. You go, oh, not that Scottish bank, this Scottish bank. So another really neat one there. Number three, charge the least possible amount for boost. Um, boost seems to be the definition. Again, four is often the link word. And why I like this is for the same reason with the last one, although it's not the definition here, it's part of the word play where the homophone applies. So this seems to read as though it's about charging a certain amount of money for something. And charge is not that meaning of charge. This time it's charge as in charge your glass. And when you do that, you fill it. So if we, if we translate charge to be fill, and we look for a boost, which is fill and two more letters, then we get fill it. The least possible amount then becomes IP. Well, that's one P, one penny, which is the least possible amount of British money. And the whole thing means boost. So you can see that the clue actually deconstructs as fill plus one P gives you boost, Philip. And that's, again, a very neat deployment of charge, um, another homophone. Now, perhaps the best homophones, though, are those that sound different. Um, I think some people talk about homographs and homophones and split the difference different meanings, but, but others don't. So this one, person displaying bathroom fixture, six letters, very simple clue in a way, it's sort of a double definition, but the answer is in fact a word that can be pronounced in two different ways and gives those meanings. And the answer here is shower, which is a bathroom fixture, but person displaying is a shower which would be written exactly the same way. So I think that's a beautifully written clue. Again, when you get it, you go, oh, of course, a shower or a shower. And, you know, the lovely click there. Homophones are a really useful thing. I think if you're cluing a word like round or sound, you might want to use a substitution clue. It's always a good idea to use a word like wound as the starter because that changes the sound in wound in, in O-U-N-D from wound to ound when you get to round or sound. Um, 
there was a beautiful one in the Times this week where a farm building had to use lose a W to become hit on the head. And that was cow shed becoming coshed. And I love that because the whole sound of cow shed has been totally changed, both syllables, by the me by the removal of one letter into coshed, which sounds totally different. And um, it's great. You know, the, the solver loves, I think, normally, getting a turnaround in their mind from the clue. Now, this last one's a little different. Again, it's a long anagram, 13-letter word, and, you know, if an, an experienced solver reading this clue knows immediately that it's an anagram of Canute a dipper, and it probably mean, and it means not respected. I mean, it does. But what I love about this clue is how that anagram, those letters for the anagram and the definition have been turned into a clue that reads perfectly for the story of Canute, or at least the original reading of the story of Canute. I think when I was growing up, it was generally accepted that Canute um, bragged that he was so powerful he could even tell this tide to stop coming in and then went down to the sea and it turned out he couldn't stop the tide coming in, got his feet wet. So he became a dipper and therefore not respected because he failed to stop the tide coming in. Now, obviously, I think that tale has been uh, re-understood since to mean that he was showing his courtiers who were bigging him up far too much that he couldn't stop the tide coming in. But... Um, the way the clue has been worded really encapsulates the original reading of the story. And, you know, that's absolutely very clever. You read that story and you go, oh, look, it's about Canute not being respected after he fails to stop the tide. But in fact, it's just a clue to the word unappreciated, which means not respected, using an anagram of the letters. So uh, solvers, again, they like, even if it's a fairly easy clue, they haven't been badly misled. But the clue seems to be about something totally different and is perfectly phrased, or very neatly phrased anyway, to, to encapsulate that story. So that's a few tips for writing clues. Um, maybe we'll do a video at one stage with some clues and, and how I would go about writing them. I mean, one other tip that I'm not exactly covering here is if an idea isn't working, just give up. You need to spend a long time on clues to get them really really to be good, and I suspect Lucy's found that already. But uh, she did come up with some very good clues, as you could have seen in Simon's video of her puzzle. So a few tips on, on um, setting crossword clues. They probably help solvers as well. And as I say, do let us know if you're interested in seeing more videos about cryptic crosswords. Um, we're very happy to do them, as well as Sudoku videos, which we also enjoy doing. So uh, that's where we are. Thanks very much for watching and I uh, hope to see you again soon on Cracking the Cryptic. Bye. For